I'm excited that we're finally here. We've been talking about totally. doing this for a long time. I know. Yeah, it's been way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Considering you've been in my life for uh, yeah. a couple decades now, I'd say this is I know, it's not overdue. say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah totally. And I think we've tried to do this a few times and I, I backed out or we didn't have the time. I don't know. Yeah. And you've had a yeah. lot going, a lot going on, you know, you've, That's we'll, we'll, sure. talk, we'll yeah. talk about it, but for people who at this point who don't know you, there's yep, a big exactly. story to tell. There is. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So let's look, let's just start um, at the beginning to be fair to everyone else. Okay. You know, I always start off with where were you born and raised? So Aaron Goodis, where were you born and raised? Um, so I was born in Vancouver, BC, uh, 1979. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Right. Well, kind of, sort of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your yeah. parents have a, or your grandparents, I don't know if they still have it. Are, are your parent, grandparents still with us? Um, no, not, they aren't. Yeah. They're, they're passed away. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did, um, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Their their house, did they, did they end up keeping that beautiful house in Harris? Oh uh, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. So we still was on my mom's side. So it's my, my mom's uh, parents. Um, and so we still have that house. It's shared between, uh, my mom and my mom's sister. Um, yeah. And so we still, we go out there and visit as much as we can. If I recall, it's on the river, on a little river itself, right? Um, well, it's really close to the Miami River, right. uh, which flows into Harrison Lake. So it's right in Harrison Hot Springs. Um, and then of course, it's just outside of the lake. So it's not, it's like a few, few uh, blocks back from the lake. So it's not like lakefront or anything, but yeah, you can walk out. It's pretty nice. Yeah. So did did you grow up fishing out there? How did you get into fishing? Yeah. So that that is quite the story. So I guess uh so basically the way I remember it is that so my dad, like we've never really been like fisher people when I was young, right? Like my dad didn't fish very much. Um, I think he dabbled a little bit in it. But um so I would have been 10 and my cousin Andrew would, would have been eight. Um, and so my parents were always looking to do something and visit my mom's parents. Uh, so we'd go to Harrison uh, on the weekends. Right. Um, and being like very like young and just energetic and stuff, we were always trying to find something to do and just bugging everybody. Um, and so my dad had actually like recommended like we have or he thought about we have all these old rods, uh, like little spinning rods and stuff. And so he just suggested that in order to um do something or get us occupied, we would just go to the Fraser River, which is quite close to Harrison. It's about 15 minutes away. Um, and there's a few little uh, little bars that you can fish on the Fraser that's right off the like the Agassiz Road, uh, Rosedale Bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, and we would just put like a worm out and just sort of see if we catch anything, right? So um, so we fished for that day and I think it maybe been a couple of hours and we'd fished a couple where we'd caught like some little like shiners. I'm not even really sure sure it was maybe like squawfish or something right um and what i remember is that i had the little spinning rod lean leaning up against a rock with the worm damp like dangling just off of the like just above the water and essentially like a big fish which we kind of maybe assume was maybe a steelhead at the time like because it was would have been they would would have been going through i think that would have been probably late summer so it's possible they're going to the you know the thompson or something and it grabbed it jumped out grabbed the worm because i mean the worm was like right on the the surface and all i remember and my we all saw it was the the basically that fish jumping big like silver fish looks like a like a salmon or a steelhead and taking the rod and just like leaving and and basically ripping across the fraser with that thing attached to it right like (laughs) and so that was kind of that was the the starting point and and i think at that point i was just like i need to catch that fish (laughs) did you get the rod back or was it gone no it was gone yeah it was gone it was like that fish grabbed the grabbed the worm and took the rod and we just watched it like skipping across the water and going across the freezer essentially yeah so pretty cool (laughs) what about fly fishing because obviously those of us who know you now know that I would argue that you're one of the best casters and fly oh. fishers and fly tires in all of British Columbia. And I think, <laughs> that's a, a, yeah, that's very kind. Of, Thank it's you. It's not kind. It's a fact. I think yeah. a lot of BCRs would agree with me. How did that all start? I, I assume you were pretty young. Um, yeah. So right around that same time. So I'm not, I don't actually, this, I've been trying to think about this because, um, I don't really know exactly how we got into fly fishing because like back then there was no internet. There was no, 
like there was no way to really see fly fishing like now, right? Yeah. And so we we ended up. I think what ap- actually happened is that we we were doing the bait fishing thing, and we were trying to explore little areas around Harrison, and so we ended up at the Chehalis River, right? So this would have been maybe that same year, um, and we saw from what I I guess what I sort of remember is that we saw someone fly fishing in the in the Chehalis River, uh, seeing the casting and stuff, and I think. Um, like basically I was always fishing with my dad and then Andrew was always with us. Um, we would, we basically saw that and was like, we need to figure out what that is. Right. Right. Um, and then just doing some research and trying, well, then it was like going to the library and getting books and stuff like that, or magazines, uh, and trying to figure out what that actually was because it was just so different than what we're used to seeing. Right. Um, yeah. And so that, I think that's kind of like the start of it. And then, uh, when i mean i guess this is actually really quite funny so i guess it kind of started with that we ended up with like a canadian tire uh little setup like a little six weight setup really cheap one um and like as kids do like we would go to like the little like the little duck pond in false creek which is where i grew up and try to cast which well, there was no fish there right but it was just the idea of trying to cast and and just fish right and uh we just did that all the time and and we'd go on the weekends every every weekend go to Harrison and and start fishing and yeah I think we basically caught I think I might have caught my first fish on the fly was like the little pump house slough which is a little tributary of the Fraser um little backwater sort of slough thing um and it was a small little rainbow trout and it happened I think probably within the first year yeah it was pretty cool yeah yeah um what about what about guiding then because I met you at Michael and Young's and at the time just to give some context for people listening yeah. I had met you were dating Adrian Camo at the time who has yeah. been a lot of people know as my best friend Adrian but at the at the time I, I was meeting yeah. I was meeting you both for the first time the, no yeah. I met you guys at the on the Thompson for the first time yeah that would have been like that's a long time ago yeah yeah for sure was it the Thompson or M and Y where uh, I no it would have been the Thompson yeah okay so then you were working at M and Y's then, but Adrian had mentioned that you and her had met guiding. So which came first, Michael and Young? Yeah. Or so guiding? well, yeah, both. So like I, yeah. So that's because uh, I was working. Like I started in the industry really early. So I started like during high school. I worked at Three Vets, which was like just a little outdoor store in Vancouver, and I did that in the little fishing department, like Friday nights, and that would have been in like I think grade maybe like eight or nine, maybe 10. Can't remember exactly. And it was always like I was covering for Harvey, who was the guy who was running that little fishing department. So that was kind of like the first taste of retail. Um, And I just, I didn't want to be there. I just, (laughs) I was doing there. I was doing the best I could. And obviously Friday nights at that age, you don't really want to be uh, sitting in a little retail shop until nine o'clock, right? No. Um, But then, so yeah, it went from there. And then I ended up guiding. Uh, That would have been, I guess, uh, Oh, well, it would have been like 19, 20, 21. So a long time ago. Uh, but that was at KPL, King Pacific Lodge. Um, and at the same time, I was working at Ruddix. I uh, started oh. working at Ruddix, yeah, fly shop, the one that was on Granville Island. Um, so I was doing that sort of part time and then working at the lodge for the three summers guiding. And then, um, yeah, I did that. And then pretty much uh got s- kind of sick from Crohn's and dealt with that and then stopped working at the at uh, Ruddix and then ended up getting a job at uh Michael and Young here in Vancouver uh shortly after they opened um and then I've been on and off but I've been basically working here in some capacity ever since and it's been 20 years yeah yeah I didn't realize and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jumble around here quickly but yeah. I didn't realize that your Crohn's diagnosis was that early I thought that that happened yeah later. no it was well yeah the diagnosis was when I was 16 uh but I was definitely sick before that like I was losing a lot of weight all the like symptoms were there um so I dealt with it probably even yeah I mean I like I probably started dealing with it when I was like 12 or 13 yeah we, so we really are going to on. speak yeah. about Crohn's because there are yeah that's who t- yeah that's that fine is. I for sure. And I, I, I think I've had, <laughs> that's the one thing with me. It's like fly fishing has always been a bit of a healing journey too, because it's a, a way for me to be out outdoors and keep my mind off other things. Cause I've had quite a few health issues as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's part of my journey for sure. Uh, Crohn's is definitely one of that was part of that for sure. 
Yeah. What What is it, and how did you realize something was wrong? Um. Yeah. So it's an it's uh well it's a inflammatory bowel disease, um, and it can affect uh a lot of different areas of your body. But in me, in my case, it was my colon. Um, so it's, it's basically, uh, yeah, what I have is what it's called. Like, um, it's, um, uh, fistulating Crohn's disease, which means that within your, uh, bowel somewhere in the bowel, for me, it was in my colon. Um, it ends up becoming like, or basically you get little, uh, fistulas, which are little tunnels that kind of get out of your, basically, how do you do it? How do I say it? It's like, um, like tunnel out of your bowel into your body somewhere and try to make it make its way at back right it's pretty it's pretty nasty stuff obviously it's not a not not a good disease and the symptoms are like loss of weight uh really bad appetite or no appetite um you know you can have like ulcers show up you can have fistulas show up you can have uh like you're you're not really absorbing anything so all the nutrients that you would be getting for through food isn't really it's just going through you. It doesn't work. So you end up with lots of, you know, runny stool and stuff like that. Like you're not, you're going to the washroom a lot. Yeah. Pretty nasty. So pretty hard to, to deal with. Yeah. And in my case, um, I've had all the things, uh, when I was younger, I was, I was very, very like low weight. Like I was definitely not absorbing very much, um, having a really hard time with it. Yeah. Really, really quite tired. And, uh, still fishing through the whole thing. And I mean, you, you take medications to help it out. And sometimes it's sur- surgery, which I've had too. So, but yeah. That's a, it's a serious health issue, especially that. It is. Early. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more information about it now. Um, at that time. Um, yeah. There wasn't a lot of information about it. Like my, it was hard to be, it was like very hard for my doctors to diagnose it. They thought it was like, just like uh other things, I guess. Yeah. Not, not Crohn's. Yeah. But it, it was so. Yeah. Um, okay. It actually well, started with like all sort of colitis, but yeah. We're going to circle back to health um, yeah. because I think it's important, you know, so many times we have these conversations and we focus on all of the shiny, bright, yeah, pos- positive for things, sure. yeah. but a timeline yeah. isn't always, um, no good news. And it's a lot not, of the times yeah. The yeah. bad news is what makes us who we are. So, and totally. I do, I think yeah. in your case, there's been a bit of that. So we are going to come back, um, okay. but bring, bring me back to your early twenties. Okay. So you, uh, why did you leave Ruddix? And you don't have to answer that, but is, did they shut that shop down? Um, no. Well, yeah. So like they basically what they, so they had two different stores. Uh, one was on gravel Island. That was the one that was close to me. Uh, the main store was just on Canada way. Um, that was the older store, the bigger store. Uh, so they had, they had one store, then they had two stores. Um, then all with the rents just increasing in price and then break-ins happening at the Canada way store, they ended up, um, like moving out of both of those locations and then doing a store in North Vancouver, um, which was right on Marine Drive, just kind of between, I would say, like Lynn Creek and the and the Capilano, kind of right in the, in the middle there. Um, so I worked there for quite a while, a few years anyways, um, and commuting through like through Vancouver and to get there was not the easiest with the Lionsgate Bridge and all that, but that was fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, unfortunately, like I was, I, well, I, I guess fortunately and not fortunately because Ah, uh, things happen for a reason in some cases. Um, and in this case, I ended up having like a Crohn's flare up. Um, so I was I was quite healthy for a while because that that's the way Crohn's works. Is like you sort of mad, manage yourself with medication, um, and then uh, when you're early on or early in the onset, when you're younger, um, the flare ups can happen regardless of medication if you haven't had surgery. Um, and as you get older, uh, usually you go into a remission stage, which I'm in, I've been in for quite a long time, um, which, so it's good. So, but then it, I wasn't, so I was managing it with, uh, with medication. I had a pretty bad flare up at that time. Um, and that puts you off work for sometimes, you know, months, right? So in this case, it was a pretty bad one. So, uh, when I went to go back to work, uh, it was pretty hard for them to, to get me back in there just because, I mean, it's small, small stores and, um, I understand, right. Like it's just the way that works. So, yeah. And I think that shop at that point, it was getting kind of close to, to the end anyways, because, uh, like it was like my Malcolm and Kathy Ruddick, that was the owners of that store. And, uh, Malcolm wasn't doing very well for his, with his health at the same time. So, 
right. that ended up closing. But yeah, but I ended up uh, here at Michael and Young in Vancouver. Yeah, which was a good move. So <laughs> worked yeah. out really well. Clearly. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> Okay. And then, and this is, again, me just going off of what I know about you just because of our own time spent together. I'm going to be missing yeah. things. Feel free to add them in. For um, sure. Yeah. But I know that you, <clears throat> I know I personally turned to you when I was going for my CCI through the Federation of Fly Fishers, mm-hmm. or International Fly Fishers now. Totally. Um, you had that quite early on, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, man, it's been, uh, it's probably been like 18 years, maybe. I don't know. It's been a long time, but I've still kept up on it. Um, so I don't teach as much as I did, uh, but I was doing a lot of that. I was teaching a lot. What did that process look like back then? Um, so back then it was pretty, pretty much the same as it is now, I think. Um, so what I did is I studied a lot, uh, practiced my casting a lot because you had to be quite good at it. Um, and then I ended up doing a test. I went to Vancouver Island and had uh, Denise Maxwell do my testing. Uh, Mike Maxwell was there as well at the time. I see. Um, so from what I remember, uh, she was doing the testing. There was another fellow named Dan McCrimmon, who is, uh, I think he's a master certified caster as well. Um, so he was helping her. And Mike was under was sitting under the tree, from what I remember, just like kind of, I mean, he was a little bit of a cranky old guy, <laughs> super <laughs> nice guy though. Um, but yeah, so he was kind of just heckling a little bit. Uh, and I was super nervous. And I mean, the, the whole thing, it's like, you have to, I've, you've, you've gone through this, the process. So it's, it's not the easiest process. Like you really do have to know what you're, what you're talking about and but you have sir, to be able to perform the cast. This, right? sir, I certainly was not tested <laughs> by Denise, yeah. Mike and Dan, whom is not easy yeah. to get through. So kudos no, to you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. so, okay. So you had to just, I, I realized I didn't say what CCI is. It's certified casting instructor yeah. through, through the Federation. So it really is not easy. Um, did you end up going on to get your, your THCI, your two hand certification? No, I never, I never did that. Yeah. I just did the CI and I just, I just stayed with that one. I was thinking about doing the masters and I also was thinking about the, the two handed one, but I, I never did that. Yeah. You are one of the best two handed casters I've ever seen. And Thanks. I'd like that to know means a lot. Yeah. How did it, how did it start? Um, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a long time ago. Uh, just like everything, like we just saw people doing it. So, um, I think from what I remember, like with going back to like the, the magazine days, cause again, like the internet was just in the very beginning with all the fly fishing stuff on there online. Um, so we, me and Drew, uh, with my dad fishing a lot, but I think at that point, Drew and I were fishing just on our own because I would have been 16 and we were going everywhere and fishing as much as we could. Um, we just saw people, there's a few people at the time spay casting on some of the local rivers. I think it was like Art Lingren and a few of these these fellows that have been doing this for a long time, kind of pioneering the two-handed uh, spay casting in BC. Um, and then I do remember there was an article in BC Outdoors that Art had written um, and it was like photos of him and like Bob Taylor and it was, they're all black and white photos with like the rubber waders and like the big, like two handed rods with hardy reels and stuff. And it was just like, and it was all steelhead fishing and we were steelhead fishing at the time, but a lot of us were, uh, center pin fishing and fly fishing with single handed rods and just kind of trying to figure it out. Um, and I was, I think we were both myself and well, definitely was just like, I need to figure out that, like, that seems really cool. Like the whole casting and like the longer rods and just, yeah, just really, really cool. So that was kind of the start of it. Um, and we just kind of figured it out. I think I ended up with, um, uh, my first spay rod was actually really neat. I was, I was having some issues with Crohn's again, cause I, I was getting, a, I was having a lot of flare ups at the time. Um, I was six turned 16 um, I'm not sure how my dad did it, but he managed to get a 9140 custom built, uh, Sage four piece spay rod from berries, um, and just gift it to me for my birthday and with a, with a line and a, and a reel and stuff. And that was the start. Yeah. And no, I never went back. <laughs> what, what line yeah. did you use? I can see all this. Uh, in my head. Well, the, the very first line was, well, back then it was a, it was a double taper. Yeah. Uh-huh. So my first line, cause I mean, we were, we were just trying to mimic the old guys and what they were doing. Um, and they were doing it like the very traditional plus also probably the hardest way, which was like a double taper line. Right. And of course, when you're trying to fish for winter steelhead, 
uh, we're trying to figure out how to put sync tips on that. And like, you know, you're probably, you probably remember like doing our single handed stuff where you're trying to like cut back like a steelhead taper, single handed line and trying to figure out how to put like loop or loop sync tips on there. Oh yeah. Um, it was the same. It just, that was a double tapered line because we weren't shooting line. It was basically just like trying to spay cast a fixed amount of, uh, amount of line, which is really difficult. Uh, we were cutting it back like maybe five or six feet, putting a loop on it and then putting um, LC13, I think was the the sync tip of choice, which was like a lead like core a braided 13. Lead, yeah, lead <laughs> core. So, yes. And it was like usually like a pretty short chunk of it and it was just like really hard to cast. Uh, but it worked. Yeah. But what <laughs> about flies? Because at that time, yeah. the flies were still pretty small, right? Do you remember when you started transitioning into some of the larger patterns? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, well, for me, like, I think we started with, uh, well, I, I, I should say I started with, um, like GPs, general practitioners, just black ones. Cause that's what, like what I was seeing in the magazines. Um, that was definitely the, the fly. There was a fellow named Ray Cernick who we'd see on the river all the time. Really nice guy. Um, and he would always have like an egg sucking leech that he tied. Uh, so that was definitely the go-to was like a, like an egg sucking leech, little black egg sucking leech. And that was the go-to, which pretty traditional little, little fly, not a big fly at all. Um, and then I think it was, it would have been probably a number of years after that, like, cause I'd, I'd started fishing the Thompson and we started the same way, like with the double tapered lines and stuff. And I started seeing like, like, well, Scott Baker, like he using like a wind cutter line and some bigger flies. And then I think the whole thing started with like the Skagit lines and like the bigger flies and things like that. And we started fishing bigger flies and tying bigger flies. And God, that would have been, I don't know, 15 years ago yeah. or more, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah. Do yeah. you remember the contention with all of that? I remember there being some drama around the bigger flies being seen yeah. as lures. Did, did you end yeah. up dealing with any of that in the shop? I mean, not really. I mean, it depends. Yeah. I mean, some people, I mean, we still see that a little bit in the shop. I should be careful with what I say, but, um, there is a lot, like, that's the one thing with, with fly fishing is that there is a lot of, uh, what would be the right word for this? Um, yeah, I, I can't think of the word right now, but I think, um, but yeah, we still deal with that. Right. So some people are going to be very stuck on a certain particular style of fishing whether it's dry line only or like floated fly only or um you know small small unweighted flies with a light sink tip or no sink tip at all and other people will fish a skagit line which is like a very short heavy piece of line that will throw a big heavy sink tip and a big fly with no problem um everybody's got their own take on that um, but there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a, there's a bit of, uh, yeah, I can't think of the word, but there's definitely drama. <laughs> yeah. There's a drama with that. I think for me, I've always been like, I just fish the conditions. I don't care what yeah. I just fish what I, what I like to fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too concerned about it. Yeah. And what's fun to cast. I, I've always liked to cast. Right. So as you know, uh, that's been a part, big part of my, uh, my fly fishing is the casting. So. Let's talk yeah. about the Thompson. Do you remember the yeah. first time you ever fished the Thompson? And was it while fly fishing? Oh yeah. Did, did you fish spoons? It, say that again. Uh, um, no, I never, I never, I never fished anything other than a fly rod. Um, I, I, yeah, I never, I was already fly fishing pretty much pretty strictly for steelhead at that time. Um, and I can say I've, I've, yeah, I, I've never actually fly fished any other way other than a two handed foot rod on the Thompson, which is kind of cool. Uh, but I remember the exact day. And I mean, my memory might be a little bit, it might be a little bit uh, different from what someone else might remember. But um, I was with Drew and I think I, we, I would have been like maybe 16 or 17. And uh, we drove, uh, it was in probably like, I don't know, October at some point, early October. Um, I had my, just had gotten my driver's license. So one of the first things we did is go to the Thompson. Um, I remember pulling in at like Shaw Springs um or i guess maybe it would have been jade springs right at the little uh chinese the grocery place? store there yeah, yeah no like right at the grocery store right on the highway there oh um yeah it's the first it's basically in the canyon it's like the first spot that you would be trying to get all the way down into the canyon uh just above the fraser there and then there's a there was a really windy trail all the way down and you get into the canyon which was not the best fly water 
but that was the only, well, I mean, the way this all worked is that we had the Thompson River, River Journal from Art Lingren. That was the only, that was like the intel was that, right? So of course that was the, we brought that book and drove there the night before and crashed in the car and, um, and just like super excited to fish. So you, you don't really sleep at all at that. Like you're just really into it, right? And I remember like the first spot in the book is that spot. So that we just wanted to go directly to that spot. Uh, we were wearing like neoprene waders with like oil, oil skin jackets and like these 200 rods, I think felt sold boots, no waiting staffs, like the whole thing. And so, you know, we got up really early, like walked down. There's a pretty windy long trail all the way in there. Um, and like took one, one step down on the rocks and like almost <laughs> bailed. And it was yeah. just like, wait a minute, this is not going to be that easy. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's kind of the, the, that's what I remember. Um, and it took, yeah, I mean, that's, and it was like, I think we've, we fished, we tried to fish that one spot. It was really, really difficult. And then we wanted to try all the other water, like up in town. So we went up there and realized pretty quickly that it was going to be like way out of our league when it comes to like wading and casting in a river of that size with those kind of slippery rocks. Right. Did they not have so. cleats back then? Oh, there was, we just didn't know. Didn't, okay. We didn't know that. They didn't know that. Yeah. I think it was, we, we figured that out pretty quick. Like with those Dan Bailey, like overshoe little neoprene booty thing, sort of cleats that go over top of your boots. Yes. Yeah. That, that made all the difference and a waiting staff that was really helpful. Oh, did you go yeah. with the staff too? Oh yeah. Yeah. I still wear, I use the staff all the time. <laughs> I should have done that. Yeah. So, yeah oh, I remember so, once so much my, easier. my yeah. foot got stuck. I was fishing this, yeah. big red, the big red yeah. rock, Ross's yeah, favorite yeah, place. Yeah, 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 totally. And my <laughs> foot got stuck and I couldn't get it out. Yeah. And I was there for yeah, like an hour crazy. with my foot stuck. God oh my forbid gosh, I yeah. would have fallen over. Yeah, no, not That would have been really bad. Yeah, 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 scary place. But see, I stayed at the hilltop. So if I didn't show up, someone yeah. would have noticed. But you guys always stayed at Circle J, right? No, I always camped. I just slept in my in my oh, vehicle. Did you? Yeah. 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 I'd go up to Hilltop and like say like say hi to the guys um every once in a while. But I was always at the at the grease hole in the little free campsite. Yeah. Oh, just sitting right there. Yeah. Okay. How come you never yeah. stayed at the hilltop? Um, I mean it was just busy and like I just sort of I don't know, had the the truck and it was right there and I don't know. It's nice to have the privacy. The gold. Yeah. What was that gold? vehicle you had was that the one that you it was had? like the there was the the ford explorer that yeah. was like one of the first <laughs> yeah the ford exploder yeah yeah exactly yeah oh yeah. I, I love it how yeah. do you how do you feel about the thompson and its closing i mean that's a whole different podcast oh, for another day that is, just... a whole, that is a that is a long <laughs> long discussion uh but in a yeah to say it shortly it's just it's heartbreaking yeah it's heartbreaking i think um i mean i I fished the Thompson every single fall as much as I possibly could since that first, that first, uh, season up there. Um, that like, I would say it pretty much shaped my entire fly fishing career. Uh, when it comes to spay casting for steelhead, it's, it's because of that river. Right. And when that river like kind of fully closed, um, to be honest, it kind of took a lot of, took the wind out of me. Like it's kind of, it changed my perspective on fly fishing a lot. Yeah. It took a little while to, and I, I mean, still has, like I'm, I'm still fly fishing for steelhead. I'm still fly fishing as much as I can. Right. Um, I've had other interests as well, but that, that definitely is, uh, you know, it's like, it's just, it's a heartbreaker. Yeah. Yeah. I've wondered about you specifically on that because I know for me and I didn't fish it as long as you did. And I wasn't up there as long as you were. Um, I've, I identified in so many ways with that river. Yeah, and, definitely. And I've wondered about you quite a bit as far as how you managed the grief, because there was a grieving process for, and a denial sure. process, yeah. I think, for a lot of us. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, I, I'm not, I've sort of like a little bit lost to, for words for that with that one, because I mean, every single fall, like you get that, there's a smell that you get, like, especially yeah. like, when you start to drive into the interior um and if you drive through that like thompson canyon or the fraser canyon into the thompson area um it just changes like the weather changes the just everything changes and you it just it's yeah i just I, i've missed that so much like it's yeah it's just uh it's crazy yeah and the mental but shift I, it's almost like when you're yeah. there you're in this zone there are no other priorities work you're not going today yeah you know, yeah, relationships, no, exactly. they're, they're waiting. That's right. Yeah, Food, exactly. you'll eat yeah. when you can. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly this, it. 
this shift yeah. and it's yeah. it was so raw and rugged and barren yeah. and hardcore. Totally. And I know for me, I've had a hard time getting my footing as far as finding another yeah. home, home. And it wasn't my home river, but, yeah. um, but I had come to identify as it being my home river and I've never yeah, been able sure. to get my footing since what well, I totally. wanted to and know I how think, you were doing. Yeah, I know. I think a lot of people, uh, felt the same, right. I think almost anyone who put any time there, uh, for any length of time, it became their home river just because it, it just meant so much. It's just such a, such a different type of, uh, atmosphere. Just it's the, I always kind of coined it like the double black diamond of like fly fishing for steelhead. Um, it's just when you think of like snowboarding or, or skiing or whatever, it's just, it's the, it's the top of the top. Like it's, if you can, if you can manage to spay cast and wade the Thompson and potentially even catch a steelhead, uh, that is probably the, 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 the best it possibly can get when it comes to spay or uh, spay casting for steelhead. Right. Um, there's just nothing else like it. And I've been pretty fortunate to, uh, fish some of the other rivers in BC, like the Dean and like the Skeena, um, and of course, all the smaller systems like the Bulkley and the Kispiox and the Copper and all that. Some of like the pretty noted named rivers that are quite good. Um, there's just nothing quite like that. It just, there's just nothing like it. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it's the one place like, I mean, outside of the fish themselves, but just, it's the one place that you go. Um, and if you think you're good at casting and then you, you think you're like pretty steady under, like on your feet, you go to the Thompson and every single time you're just like, you just feel like so small. <laughs> like it's just it's like, so oh, humbling. It's just, yeah, it's super humbling. Exactly. That is the word. Yeah. For and, sure. and that's yeah. what it is. It's almost like when you're there, only the strong survive. Yeah. So totally. when you see each other, even yeah. if you don't like each other's method of angling, even if you don't like each yeah. other, there's this yeah. bit of this is there's this unspoken respect of I don't like you, yeah. but I can appreciate you. Exactly. Totally. Yeah, that's so oh, true. Oh, you're making, making me yeah. really miss it. But no, and at the same time. I know, time... I miss it so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well... I fished a bunch for trout this summer and and uh, it was kind of, it's been hard to go back even for that, but I did. And it was, I mean, it was really, really cool. Like I would highly recommend doing that if you have a chance to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a different vibe and it's, um, it's, it's different. Yeah. It's warm yeah. and you can camp out yep. and it's the trout, are, trout but... are amazing. Can you still yep, not fish it's... from a boat for trout? I don't think so. Yeah, I just go on foot. I don't think you're allowed to. Because, you know, while all of that was happening, the well, fishing on the Thompson, while all of that was happening, Vancouver was developing. Chilliwack yeah. was a little slower, but also developing. Yeah. And and it's almost like we, we s- turned around and everything around us, behind us, had changed. And for me, I, I was at that point in my career, I was traveling and moving. And I know... Yeah you know, you also travel a bit, but you're in Vancouver. Did you yeah, feel and, yeah. totally stuck? What did you do? Where did you go? Uh, as far as fishing goes? Yeah. Just, and yeah. Mental, mental clarity. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually having that probably more now than ever before because mm-hmm. Vancouver is, is just changing so much right now. It's like, I think, um, I mean, even during that time, like it actually was, I mean, it was changing a lot, but I was younger and I wasn't noticing it as much. Right. Um, now as a, a, at my age now, like I definitely am noticing a huge shift in Vancouver. Um, it's just, it's been, I mean, it's another, that's another topic altogether, but it's just, it's definitely a, a big change in trying to deal with that and just how busy it is everywhere. Um, local rivers and stuff like that, very busy again, but um, but yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It just, I've always been, I just, I, I grew up here, so I'm just used to it, I guess. Yeah. I don't really, uh, yeah. I'm not when, sure what to say with that. Yeah. When was the last time you fished the better? Actually, uh, Thursday. Was <laughs> it, isn't Thursday. it insane? Yeah. Did you see, remember yeah. where the old motel used to be? And now there's all those fancy shops. Yeah. Oh, and that is it's just totally. Yeah. It's very, <laughs> very different. Like the whole, the bridge is different. Like there's like, well, there's like that new shop right there. It's like, it just, it's crazy how different it is, but the river itself hasn't changed that much. I mean, it cha- changes like any other river does, but, um, it's the atmosphere is pretty much the same. I would say. Yeah. I actually managed to catch a steelhead on the fly no way. Uh, this, this season. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. First one in a long time. How is the Squamish yeah. winter run fishery these days? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's not a lot of like, there's not a lot of true research done on those systems, right? Um, that number has always been kind of thrown around that it's like that sort of thousand fish 
um, that come back that are that makes up the entire system, which would be like the Chekhamis, uh, the Mamquam, the uh, Ashley and Elaho, and then of course the main stem Squamish. Uh, most of those fish are likely going to be in the Squamish and the Chekhamis, which only a, with a small handful that would be in the other system, other tributaries. Um, so it's not not a big number, that's for sure. But there's a lot more pressure there. Uh, you probably remember uh, like going up the upper Squamish and, you know, having a pretty good chance just because, I mean, there was pretty low numbers, but not that many people actually fishing, mm -hmm. um, not compared to like, say the Vetter, right? It was like quite a big oh, yeah. difference to go up to the Squamish. Um, now, because of Squamish, like just like the, the actual little town there, it's just, it's just, it's, um, it's just growing really, really, really fast, right? Population is probably tripling or more. Um, so you're seeing like a huge change there. And I think uh, with COVID and stuff like like fishing and fly fishing being a little more popular um, since then, just because of being an outdoor sport and stuff and being kind of safe that way. Um, yeah, you're seeing a lot more people. Right. Yeah. Um, how have you guys noticed, uh, or let me rephrase, how yeah. have things changed since COVID in the shop? Have sales multiplied? Um, yeah, I mean, in the shop during COVID and and directly after up until about now, it's it's been crazy. Um, some of the busiest months we've ever seen. It's just it went from being like pretty scared to like not have a store and not be able to sustain it through COVID to how do we actually manage it with uh, with staffing and um, and just and product, right? Like just trying to keep products on the shelf and the shelves. But um, yeah, we it's been really really good. Uh, lots, lots of extra sales, lots of big numbers, and it's starting to slow down a little bit, coming back to maybe a bit of a normal now. Right. As someone who's worked yeah. in fly shops for over 20 years, yeah. what's it's the crazy. biggest, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen? Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's, I think it all blends a little bit for me, right? So it's hard to kind of pick one thing. Um, I think one of the things that really kind of does stand out is the, the type of person that comes in the shop. Um, so, you know, back in the day, like when I was starting out in, in fly shops, being like in my sort of like early 20s and stuff into like even early 30s, um, the kind of customer or the person that comes in the shop was your sort of typical like older uh, male person, right? He's just making or bu buying stuff for fly fishing, that kind of customer, right? And now you're seeing a lot more of younger people, um, lots, a lot more women coming in the shop. So it's, it's nice. Yeah. It's just seeing a, a, a big difference in that, that way. What about nice. yeah. uh, focus on species? Uh, as far as like, yeah, people like, well, I mean, steelhead is, is, is huge. Yeah. I'd say it's definitely one of the more popular, uh, things to fish for, although we don't have a lot of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's about the same. I mean, it, there's not a huge change. I mean, like in, in BC, uh, in Vancouver, I mean, you don't have, it's basically the same. It's like, you see some, the, I guess the only real change is that you're seeing some bass and stuff in some of the, some of the areas. Um, although not a huge fishery yet, uh, but steelhead fishing in the, in the winter is definitely a pretty big one. You're seeing a lot of people, um, spay casting for steelhead, which we didn't see before. Um, and of course, salmon fishing has changed a lot. Like the regulations have changed around it where, there was a time when you could just go salmon fishing in the river when, as long as there was salmon there, whether it was catch and release or not, uh, you could still catch and release, right? Um, now the regulations change, so you can't actually target salmon unless they have an opening for it, whether it's catch and release or not. Um, so that's definitely a big change. So, you know, for those who are like fishing for pinks on the Squamish or uh, even fishing for, you know, anywhere really, like the, say like um, on the Harrison or anything like that, uh, you, you can't just assume that you can just go catch and release uh, unless they open a uh, fishery for it, whether it's catch and release or like a retention fishery, which is quite different in trying to explain that to people that um, that you you do need to kind of be a little bit more attentive to that. It's, that's a, def a, a big difference. How do they yeah. manage that? I mean, it's always been hard I trying to get people that's, to understand the different yeah. species. They think a yeah. coho is a Chinook. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is it. I don't know how they manage that. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I mean, we we are told um, that potentially, depending on the game warden, if you, if you were to see one out there, um, that they would basically look at your tackle and make a decision as to what you're fishing for based on the weight of your rod, 
uh, the fly selection that you have, right? Um, but like, say on a place like the Squamish, where you might be fishing for bull trout and you might have an eight weight single handed fly rod with a heavy sink tip and a big bull trout type streamer. I mean, how can you say that like, and they might, if a, if a game warden doesn't know better, they might be like, well, that's a salmon setup. And you're like, no, it's totally not. Right. Or why can't I spay cast for bull trout just because I want to spay cast. Like it's just, it's a weird one. Yeah. What a nightmare. Your photography. Yeah. I remember all of that starting and you yep. knocking my socks off. You are so talented, especially Thanks. when it comes to, is it aperture or shutter speed with the water? Oh yeah, that's the, yeah, that's, that's your shutter speed. Yeah, for sure. How did yeah, you get slow into... Slow shutter speed makes the, the kind of like milky water or like the blurry water. How did, how did you get into photography and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool question. I like that. Um, yeah. So basically there, there is a reason why. Uh, so I guess it started with my dad being a photographer, um, back in the film days, more for fun. He also did a little bit like for his, for his job. Um, and, but the, the reason I ended up getting into it is that again, it was through Crohn. So it's like, it's funny how like the illness or having the disease, which can be really bad on one hand, can actually end up steering you in a direction that you'd never know that you would go that way, right? Um, so I was in a situation where I was in St. Paul's, I was dealing with a pretty heavy Crohn's flare-up, and I would have been uh, probably about 20, maybe 26 or 27. Um, and I was had been fly fishing all the time before that. Um, and so this is a kind of a bit of a side story or a side note on this is that one of the medications that was used at that time and probably still is, um, to help with Crohn's is a steroid called prednisone. Um, so that's a, that's a medication that helps with, uh, Crohn's flare ups and kind of gets stabilizes your body, but it's got a, some really bad side effects. Um, one of the side effects is bone density loss. And so if you're taking, uh, that particular steroid, which has been used for, I think, other diseases as well. It's a pretty common one. Um, but if you're if you're not really truly following the doctor's uh, procedures with that, or not how much you use with that, um, it can definitely do a pretty pretty, or it can do a lot of damage to your bone structure over long time, long t- periods of time. Um, and unfortunately, because I was at that age, uh, Crohn's was it was known about, but it was still kind of early stages with um, all the research that they were doing, uh, they tended to use the prednisone as a, as the medication, right? So I was on medic on the prednisone for on and off for quite a long time, uh, for almost 10 years. And without knowing it, I was kind of like destroying my, my back essentially. Right. So when I was, yeah, one of the, when I had that big flare up, one of the problems is that you're dealing with um like no absorption in your in your gut like in your bowel so you're not taking in anything as well as the prednisone basically deteriorating your bone structure and i ended up with uh, a number of small fractures in my spine which basically stopped me from work from walking right so uh, i was pretty i mean i wasn't paralyzed i could had i had all movement but the actual like weight bearing was an issue. Right. And so, um, long story short, I was put on a medication that made a huge difference over time. And it's, it's back to a hundred percent normal now, which is incredible with lots of hard work on both my, my part, doctor's part and the medication, um, doing its job too. But at that time, uh, that doctor basically said that, uh, if this medication doesn't work for you, to help create more bone structure and, and help with that part, the idea of fly casting could be very detrimental to your your back, right? Because there's a lot of torque with fly casting. He doesn't really, he wasn't a fly caster, so he wasn't really completely aware of how that actually works. But um, he was just saying that like, it's very likely that it would be very hard for you to fly cast. So um, I think for me, I've always had a pretty good positive outlook on all the like different health issues that I've had. And so at that time I was like, well, if I can't fly cast and I can't partake in the sport, well, then I'm going to take pictures of it. So I was like, that was kind of like my outlet. I'm like, I can, I can, if I, as long as I can walk, I might not be able to like fly cast because that could be putting a lot of like, or making, it could damage my back if I wasn't careful. 
but not thinking that like potentially the weight of a camera bag would also could potentially do that, uh, which it never did, luckily. But I think um, having a camera out there and taking photos of it would be a way of still being involved in that sport, right? Um, so that's that was sort of the idea was that if, if I can't if I can't fly cast, I'm going to take pictures of it. So as I healed, I started using my dad's film camera for for the start and shot a bunch of rolls of film and and got lucky with some of the photos and some people liked the photos and was kind of like, ah, oh. and I actually really enjoyed the process of doing that. Um, and then shortly after that, bought my first digital camera, digital SLR, and started taking photos a little bit more, like a little more seriously. And then everything started to heal up and I went, you know, fishing again and casting and everything was fine. And the, the camera st- just stuck with me the whole time. Um, I will say that there was a, there was a moment there that I went back to fishing and, and, the uh, the fly fishing definitely were, was first <laughs> and the camera was second. And then that kind of shifted and it turned to be the camera was first and the fly fishing was second. And now it's kind of gone back again, but <laughs> that's, that's the, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's how it started. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I'm looking yeah. at your photos differently now. Yeah. yeah thanks. I know a lot yeah. of those photos were taken up in the Harrison area. Yeah. And I just figured the beginning, that for sure. you were out mm-hmm. running around and taking pics, but now, but so you weren't feeling well. No, it was a healing mission. Yeah. It wow. was a recovery project is what I, what I sort of coined it was like the recovery project, which was needing to wait bear as much as possible um so walking weight bearing in any possible way started very slowly um and progressed and progressed and progressed right and then uh started carrying like my camera around with a camera bag which was started light with just like a camera and a lens uh, and it got heavier and heavier with more gear and more lenses and um and just continued to go that way and and then i actually what's kind of funny is that I mean, I I tend to kind of say like that camera bag being more weight than I was probably supposed to be carrying uh, helped with my recovery quicker because it was all, it was more weight bearing, right? Like there's lots of walking and a lot of yeah. weight on my back. Yeah. It's progressive yeah. overload. And and exactly. now you've started yeah. with moving with film as well, which is that a new addition? Excuse me while I repeat. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, um, it's all, it's always been still photography. That's like my, my number one passion, I would say when it comes to the photography side of it. Um, but yeah, I've been shooting like some video work as well. And, and just, I've always done it for fun. Like I actually shot videos for fun. Like when I was skateboarding and snowboarding way back in the day, um, uh, not really thinking of anything. And then I, then I stopped doing that for, you know, for a long, long time and kind of came back to it a little bit now. And, and I think you just you sort of incorporate moving images. They're all they're all images at at the end of the day, whether it's still photos or moving moving photos, right? So it's yeah. Good point. And just a little yeah. plug here: you're going to be filming our masterclass with Tim Arsenal. Yes, I'm Very super exciting. excited for that. Yeah, Me definitely. Too. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. That's uh, yeah, I can't wait for it. No, you yeah. guys are a great team. How did you two Thanks. team up? For people listening. Um, Tim is a wonderful, also a wonderful angler and spay caster, whom I also met on the Thompson. How did you guys meet? Yeah, um, yeah. So we, I think we met through the shop. Um, just uh, yeah, through the shop, and then being on the vetter and and both spay casting, and um, that's kind of how we met. I think we were both. I think Tim. I think uh, he was really into casting, and so was I. And so there weren't too many people that were like kind of doing the fly casting or the spay casting more than the trying to get a fish thing. Right. Right. Um, for both of us, it was like kind of both, like we're both trying to catch a fish, but, uh, the casting part was a huge part of it. Um, and I think, yeah, we just ended up being buddies because of that. And yeah, and just been, been really good friends ever since. Clearly working. Um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about what you went through recently? Because I saw you at Catherine's wedding and was dumbfounded to hear about some of the health issues that you'd had. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I, I do have my my hair, my fair share of health issues. Um, so yeah, so I like, yeah, that's just it's just it's not so like when I try to like talk about it, sometimes I'm just kind of like shocked that it's even has happened, right? Because I tend to recover pretty well too, um, which is very lucky. But yeah, so basically I guess seven years, probably just about eight years ago. Um, I was working here at the store, uh, and I had like a pretty bad headache 
the night before. And I had had a few headaches that were a little worse than they probably should be over those lot, like that kind of couple of years. Um, but this one came back uh, the next day when I was working here. Uh, long story short, um, I had uh, a stroke from it, which was not like your typical like sort of stroke that most people get. It was, they called it like RCVS, which was a va uh, vascular um, cerebral, uh, trying to think of what the, what it stands for now. Anyway, it's a spasm within the artery uh, in your brain, right? And the spasm, which was bad enough to uh, basically rupture that artery, uh, which caused like a pretty bad stroke. Yeah. Um, so I lost uh, all like movement on my right side. It was on my left side, the stroke. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty big recovery on that one too. <laughs> yeah. My last podcast, we were talking about men's mental health. And yeah. one of the guests, one of my guests, Andrew Grillos, was talking about his stroke and just the recovery process. And obviously it prompted me to, talk, to chat both on and off record about other friends of mine who have had strokes. Yeah. And at the wedding, I was speaking to a couple of friends who have had or been yeah. close to having strokes. How have you recovered and how are you sitting here right now so yeah. health, apparently healthy? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it is pretty healthy. Yeah. Pretty lucky. Um, I don't know. Somehow, <laughs> somehow it just, uh, things are just, I, I, there's a part of it that's just like, if when it's not your time, it's not your time. Right. Um, so I do, I do sort of believe in that. Um, and there's also some luck involved. It's also medic medical at attention, uh, very quickly. So like, as an example, um, so I was supposed to be on the Thompson cause the Thompson was still open at that time. I was supposed to go with my dad to the Thompson to fish, uh, for steelhead. It was in the fall. Um, and had I been there, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be alive. Right. Cause at that point there was no cell phone coverage up there. Now there is. Um, but I, yeah, I, I was, I didn't, yeah, I didn't go. And I actually worked instead in the shop. Um, and so I ended up, uh, having this headache, uh, and I basically walked out the back of the store to my car. Um, it was getting worse, and I sort of, I have my my partner, Yasmin, uh, who's with me now. Um, she was, uh, I had called her saying, I have this headache again, and she was with me the night before. Um, and she was like, okay, like, that's, like, she's very concerned about it. And I was like, yeah, it just feels different. It's like just a really bad headache. And um, she said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to come just stay where you are. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to drive over to where you are. Right. She's a nurse, um, right? No, she's a, she's a, she's, uh, she's a social worker. Oh, I thought, I thought yeah, at the so wedding no. and there was a lot going on. I thought she was working yeah. at the hospital or something. She is. Yeah. She is at the hospital. Uh, but oh, as a social okay. Worker. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So she's pretty, pretty familiar with a lot of this stuff too. Um, yeah. And then, so basically what happened is that headache turned into, um, me being in the car and starting the car and thinking like, maybe I'm just going to try to drive home. Cause my, my brain was already starting to do a little, like just was not firing on all sides. Right. And, um, I tried to drive away and realized that I couldn't actually move my foot to the gas pedal. Right. Like I couldn't move my foot. Um, it's a feeling I'd never had before. Obviously it was a really very strange feeling, and realizing that I also couldn't move my right arm to do anything. So, and I like, so it was all happening very, I mean, it sounds like it was happening very fast, right? So it was all happening very quickly. Um, and I opened my, my passenger or my driver's side door and just like basically yelled for some help. Right. Um, because I think in my brain, like there, you know, everything was happening, but I knew that something was really wrong. Um, and there was a, a young couple from what I've been told uh, was was on the street walking and they actually came over and called an ambulance and because I was right here at the back of the store uh, in Vancouver very close to VGH hospital um, this all they were able they called so if there wasn't it, like basically it's the way the whole thing works is that like if those people weren't there then it would have been maybe another a number of minutes or maybe even a longer time for someone to actually help um, it's all timing, right? Uh, there was an ambulance driver 
when they called, who was like in the area, like on like just kind of, I guess, just cruising around, right? How they, I, I don't, I guess that's what they do sometimes. Or they're maybe he was going somewhere, coming back from somewhere, I don't know, um, with no one in the in the vehicle. So he was able to take the call. Um, so I do, I was blacking in and out. And so I remember him like dragging me out of my car and like you were basically saying, are you, are you able to like walk? And I was not able to really respond. Um, and then I was in the ambulance and then I was at VGH and then into uh, immediate surgery. Um, so full on surgery and then uh, woke up from surgery and, and knew everyone. Like my parents were there. Yasmin was there. Um, and I knew I could see everybody and I knew everyone, I knew who they were. Right. So that was like the first step, which was, which was like, okay, like my memory's still there at least a little bit. Right. Um, but I couldn't talk and I couldn't, uh, use my right side at all. Um, so two weeks in VGH, um, in ICU and then almost a year at GF strong, uh, in and out of GF Strong, uh, basically learning to walk, talk, and move again. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, and then after that, I mean, there's a lot of like luck involved with where the bleed happened because it's it's a bleed, right? Um, and so the bleed, um, from what I've been told, was a really bad one. <laughs> it's really big, but it wasn't in the front and it wasn't in the back, which is like um your memory and stuff so it was my memory was salvaged so as soon as i could start talking i could say everything right like i just but i had to relearn how to it's all the mo it was all motor skills so right side motor skills and and speech those are the two things that were really affected um so it took almost two months to start walking again um and then doing uh lots of like therapy and gf strong learning how to talk again and peace, but my brain was still working. It was just all those things, right? Um, and then, yeah, then just a lot of hard work on like my end. I mean, luckily, um, because uh, before the stroke, like I was, I'd really gotten myself into pretty good shape. Like I was going to the gym a lot, which I had never really done before, um, really taking like control of my health and building up a lot of strength and all that, which I think um, really helped that recovery. So, um, I had that routine going, so I continued that routine as soon as I could with G, like in GF Strong, and then after GF Strong, um, once I was out of there and I was able to be on my own again and and walk walking and talking and all that stuff, um, going to the gym and just continuing to strength train and uh, work on everything, right? And I just continue to do that now. But yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty crazy story that. Uh, um probably very very lucky to be alive never mind to be functioning at the level i'm functioning now and i'm still it's not 100 percent. like i don't know if it'll ever be 100 percent um probably more noticeable to me than anybody else um when i get like stressed and nervous it, it's more noticeable or if i'm in like a kind of like a weird situation it'll be a little more like if i'm trying to wade like in a river that took a long time to get back that's that's a tough one yeah because you sort of have like you feel very like, like heavy in your legs. So like when you're waiting, uh, when you're a strong waiter, it doesn't matter how heavy you actually are. You can just kind of like, you put your center of gravity really low, right? And you can really wait quite well. Um, and yeah, somehow I was able to do that pretty well myself. And I've had a hard time getting that back. So I've never really gone completely back to it, but yeah, but can, I can cast and wade and all that. So it's good. Any for people listening, um, just in case there's someone listening who's yeah. going through recovery yeah. right now, because I again I'm I'm finding my email. Yeah. I, I hear from members who say, I don't know if you know that I had this problem or I'm currently hospital bound with, with yeah. this injury or this, you know, whether it's a heart attack or stroke. Yeah. Heart surgery was the one I got this yeah. morning. What can they do to get themselves back um into fishing shape, even if they're not able to go to the river? you have any suggestions? Yeah, a lot of walking if you can, right? So I think a lot of it is really to do with like, or it, it, it has to do with what that person's able to do, right? Uh, so firstly, it's somehow trying to manage like a really positive outlook on everything. Like if you can see the bright, bright side, um, that's a really big one. So, and then just, it's small. It's like just small, it's very small steps, right? It just takes a long time. 
Um, but walking uh, is a lot. Uh, it's a big one or trying to um, very slowly like strength train or trying to work on your coordination. Like, so for me, it was like doing things that like um, things I never would have thought. So like at GF strong, because they knew I was a fisherman and I was, I, I was saying like, I'm going to have to be able to get in the river and wade and stuff. So they're using like, like those big rubber bands and they're having me actually walk against the, the, the elasticity of the band. Right. And so they were using that as imagine like the water's pulling on you. And so there's just doing like some really neat sort of, uh, training that was helping me do like to kind of get back to it that way. just trying to get that sort of coordination back. Um, but I think beyond that part, like when you're already out and doing your own thing, I think a lot of it is just, um, just doing a lot of walking and walking on like all different types of sort surfaces. So staying not just on like you start with like obviously cement and just easy walking, but if you have any trail around where you live, um, just start slow um, and try to, you know, get yourself going into small hikes and just start moving your, yourself up. Right. So you're doing maybe a little bit longer hikes or maybe a little bit more, uneven terrain, things like that, where you're getting, you're working on your balance and working on your coordination when you're, when you're walking, bring like a hiking stick or even like two, two poles, like hiking poles. They're, they're very good for balance for just help when you're walking around. Right. Um, yeah, I think those, those are things that definitely help. And then I was in the gym, I was using, um, like those little step, like those little, uh, stepping, uh, like, uh, tiles or whatever, you can like step them up, you can make them quite tall. Um, and so you're using, you're basically doing these big steps over and over again. So that's really putting a lot of, uh, you're strengthening your legs that way. And you can hold right. some small weights if you want to, like things like that. Yeah. What about hand cord, hand, um, yeah, coordination? for me. Yeah, totally. That's a, the, for me, it was the camera. That was a big one for me. Yeah. So like, cause my, when, so for all, for all my photography, I use like a digital SLR, which is a fairly heavy camera and they're they're all right-handed controlled right so it's not something i completely t took for granted until it was i was in a situation where it's like wait a minute like if i can't use my right hand what do you do right like how do you actually function with a camera that's like right-handed if you can't use your right hand to hold or to like do all the buttons you can hold it with your left um so for me i actually because i was able to get movement in my hand earlier on like pretty early on i was so as soon as i had the ability to hold my camera i had my dad bring my camera in and i was like what like you know basically well first it was like in a wheelchair but then i was walking around taking pictures and having that hand on my camera and using all the it's like very fine uh, uh movements motor movements that you're trying to move your your all the buttons and stuff that was a huge one for me so i don't know if that would relate to anyone else if they're into a if they're into photography, it would definitely help. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's probably, to be honest, that and then fly tying, that was another one. Yeah. So I'm a fly this. tire and fly tying with my right hand. Um, that took a little bit longer because it's a really fine motor movements to try to, you know, with trying to tie the, like the finishing knots and things like that, the whip finish and stuff. Right. Um, but tying flies was a big one. Um, they do like in, in GF strong, they do like, hand training courses like they actually like they do as as small thing or like just easy things as like taking like a phone and like punch like pushing the the buttons right like little things like that just to get your your fingers moving but um so they have a whole bunch of little little different tricks for them to do that but i think in my case it was like the camera honestly that's what made a, a big difference and then fly tying how about coordination in and your then, of mind? course casting of course. Yeah. What what about hauling? Yeah. Was it hard for your brain to yeah. have both your hands yeah. work together? Totally. Yeah, it still is a little bit. Um, yeah, that's the one thing. It's like you like <laughs> it's like driving standard, like for instance. Yeah. So yeah, so before I could drive standard, like Yasmin had she had like an old Subaru, uh it's a standard, and it was like a real a really touchy one, like not an easy one to to drive. And I was really good at it, right? And then so when I was able to get my drive, cause I, I wasn't able to drive for a while. Right. And then I had to go through like driving training and all that and make sure I'd be safe on the road. Um, and I was on Vancouver Island with her and we were doing a little camping trip and taking some photos and stuff. This is like about maybe almost 
well, a week, uh, maybe a year and a half after the whole incident, right? So I was able to get driving pretty quick, but I wasn't able to drive at that point. And I finally got the call from my dad when I was there uh, that your driver's license came back through. Like you can, you can drive. Right? So I already had the license, but they were suspended it until they feel you're safe. Right. So I'd gone through all the training and they were just going through the last processes. And so I got the letter in the mail saying like, yeah, you can, you can drive again. Right. So of course I was like, well, I'm going to try and drive. And I couldn't, I could not drive that standard. Yeah. There's just no way it's all things, right. It's like both hands, both feet moving at the same time. Didn't work. Yeah. It didn't work. So that was the, that was the issue, but um, yeah, but, but hauling is kind of like that. Right. Cause you're sort of, you're trying to like, yeah, all the coordination from your, your fly casting as well as uh, your left hand doing the haul. If you're, if you're a right hand caster um, and it's taken, it's taken some time. Yeah. It's not the easiest. What's easier for you now, a single, a single hand casting or double hand casting, spay casting? Um, I do. I just double hand cast more. So that would be the one I'm, I'm just, I'm probably better at, or just, I'm just, it's just easier for me. Cause I do it all the time. Um, but honestly, like the single hand casting, I just go in the park and I practice, um, and I don't go as much as I should, um, but it's come right back. Like it's, I think it's pretty good now. I think it's, it's, if anything, it's probably pretty close to what it was. Um, but it's taken some time for sure. And the double hauling is all, it took a while to get that back, but yeah, it's, it's, it just takes time, a lot of practice, but it's a great, great coordination, uh, uh, just practice skill or whatever to have. Right. So it's. So being in your yeah. mid forties now and having gone through yeah. such a life changing experience, yeah. have you had yeah. any revelations about moving forward with the rest of your life and career? Um, <laughs> kind of, and kind yes and no. Um, I think I had a lot more of that like earlier on. Cause like every time, like everyone says that if you go through like, in this case, like, I guess you would say it's almost like a near death experience. Cause I mean, it could have changed my, well, I mean, it did change my life a lot, but it could have been a lot, a lot worse. Got pretty, I would say very lucky with this one. Um, yeah, you just kind of start looking at life differently, but then unfortunately life also just catches up, right. And you start to go back to what you're used to and you go back to work and you start, you know, your life just, it just kind of comes back to what it was. And, it's easy to sometimes forget that you've gone through something so serious. Uh, so I have to actually remind myself with that. Cause I, like I can get stressed out just like anybody else. Like, you know, life is, can be stressful, right. And with work and trying to figure out, you know, as an artist to trying to figure out how you're going to get more work. And it's just, it can be quite, uh, can be quite tough. Um, but what I try to do is I try to, see the bright, bright side in everything if I can and try to remind myself as much as I can uh, that, you know, when you've gone through something so crazy that like you just have to take every day as as a blessing, right? And just be really happy and be uh, really positive every day. Not the easiest to do that all the time, but that's that's what you have to do. Yeah. So what's next for your yeah. career and, and life? What's around the corner? Um, yeah, not, not, uh, not nothing too, too crazy. I think uh, I'm just going to continue to work in the shop here, uh, continue to build my, my photography business. That's always, it's always a tough one, but I continue to do that. Um, that's probably it as of right now. Yeah. It's nothing too. Yeah. That's it. Enjoy life. Yeah. Good. Try to catch another steelhead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a quick rapid fire and then I'll let you go because I know it's getting late there. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah. And, and I've got to pick up a child from school. Yeah. <laughs> but what over the last 20 years, say, what are the top three things that you have either learned or changed your mind about when it comes to fishing for steelhead? Um. Yeah, I think the one of the top things is to just learn, like love the process and not the outcome right? Um, try not to be too caught up in the catching of the fish and try to enjoy everything else around it. Um, I think that's, especially when you're steelhead fly fishing, you sort of have to do that or you're not going to stick with it. Uh, but that's a big one. Um, yeah, I think those, those are the two that really, when it comes to like with fishing, I think, uh, and I think um, also just try to like, yeah, just try to, en I mean, just try to enjoy it the best you can. Like everything's changing. The runs of the like runs of fish are getting smaller. Um, there's more people out there and it, it's easy to get frustrated with those things. But if you can just go and go and enjoy it and enjoy the process, you'll you'll be fine. 
Um, here's one I wasn't going to throw at you out of respect for you, but, um, and, and our time, <laughs> but I'm going to throw yeah. it anyway. Okay. Big, Bigfoot or no Bigfoot, Aaron Goodis? Oh, that's a good question. I, <laughs> that would, that would, I, there's like, I have some stories with that, that I'll, I, I won't go on into now. That's maybe another, another time, but tell um, me some, I, don't know. I know some of them. Tell, I don't me, know. The, tell me the ones you're I'm willing on to share. The, I don't, I'm on the fence. I don't know. I can't, I can't say for sure either way. I can't say for sure, but I've definitely had a few experiences that are definitely very strange that I, that I, I can't really explain. So did you ever bring those photos in? Remember you had those photos? Yeah. Um, and yeah. you brought them into someone at the university. Was it the university you brought no, them into? Yeah, no, it was here actually. This a fellow named Ron. I'm, if this is the same story that we're talking about with the with the prints, the prints, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell, I still have those prints. Can yeah. you share the story, so, well, please? Yeah. So that really, really quickly, uh, there's a fellow uh, Ron who's now passed away, but he's a very well known tracker, hunter, um, outdoorsman, and uh, wait, artist. Ron, your wait, Ron, whom? Uh, what's his, I can't think of his last name at the moment. Not, it wasn't your, no. okay. Okay. No, no. Yeah. He was, uh, friends of, with Gary in the shop here. Really nice, nice fellow. Um, he did all like the, like really, really like realistic duck carvings. Like they're really incredible. Um, but he's, he's like, like very much an outdoorsman. And so I told him about these prints cause he was kind of like, he was interested and he basically wrote them off right away. was like, Oh no, there's probably a double bear print or whatever. Right. There's all the reasons what, what it could be. So I brought those prints in and I'll never forget it. He looked at those prints and he was just like, huh, that's really strange. <laughs> he had no, he couldn't, he was just like, I don't know. That's just a really weird print. And so I don't know. I, I can't say like, I don't, I don't believe, or I don't disbelieve. I don't know. Right. Um, but that's uh, a pretty, I, pretty I strange, uh, for the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, what, yeah. I also have got stories, but mo- a lot of them are just from, from friends and, and family. Yeah. Um, totally. tell me, tell me your best one, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. So like, well, there's, there's one in particular, it's a little bit of a longer one. I'll try to keep it short. No, it's okay. Uh, go, go, okay. I, I do have time to so go for it. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so this is back, I would have been probably 16 or 17 as Drew and I and my dad, and we were fishing the Chequemus river. Okay. So that's the location. Um, and so you remember like Fergie's first bridge, you drive up the road, second bridge is where you park and you fish between the two bridges on the okay. Chequemus. I don't fish the check, but yes. I, okay. I, well, that's I'm basically following. the zone. Yeah. Okay. So that's the zone. Um, so when you're steelhead fishing there, you're always looking for the, at the first bridge to see if there's anyone parked there, right? Because they're either going to go down and they're going to, or they're going to go up. And if, and you don't really know if they've gone up or down, but you sort of have to go, okay, there's a, there's either no or no car there, or there's a car there. And in this case, there was no car there. So we're like, okay, perfect. So you drive to the second bridge and you park. And back then, I mean, it wasn't very busy there. Um, so you would see there'd be maybe a car there or not. And again, they, the person either goes up or down. And if they've gone up, then that, that leaves that middle section, which is like a couple kilometers of, of water, uh, four or five different runs, pretty much with no one on those runs, right? And that's kind of the best water at that time for a steelhead fish in the Chequemus, right? Um, so at this point, there's no one there. So we have basically the entire place for our, to ourselves, which is perfect. Uh, so what we do is we basically walk uh, down river on the left side. You go down, there's a set of train tracks that runs along the left side of the river. Um, you basically get up on the tracks and you walk down and into the middle of that zone, you have a couple of runs. Ones we used to call them uh, two rocks. Uh, then there was the smokehouse, um, and then there was the log jam. So there's three runs that are kind of like the go-to spots that are right in the middle of that little zone, right? Um, and it's it used to be quite good for steelhead fishing, especially when there's no one around. So uh, that particular morning, my dad was fishing the smokehouse because they're kind of like sort of like one to two person max spots. Um, so you're sort of, you're sharing it a little bit, but you're also sp- like spreading out a little bit. And so Drew and I went down to the log jam, which is like a big corner run. It was a beautiful run with a big log jam on the other side. And we we're fishing that and both spay casting. And so we're fishing the run and for whatever reason, there's like the train tracks are kind of like on your left side, but the way this sets up is that like you walk the tracks And then the river goes away from the tracks and then it kind of comes back to the tracks and you have this big sort of zone with all the bush behind between the tracks and you and the river. 
um, gravel bars on your left side. And then you're fishing that whole like sort of corner. And then eventually you come back to the tracks and you walk your, yourself back out. Right. Um, so what happened is that, uh, well, firstly, when you come to this, when you go past the log jam and you get all the way down, the river hits the tracks again, you have the rip wrap and it's quite a deep spot. And there's really no way at that, at that point, there's no way to like walk across there. It's like a big kind of back eddy pool. Um, no way to wait it. Um, so we're fishing the log jam, which is maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred yards, maybe 300 yards from the, the track. So quite a ways down, um, but definitely like in, in like in eyesight, you can see everything. And so what we thought was seemed to be a person kind of came out onto the tracks. I know keeping in mind, there was no cars at either spot, uh, either parking spot. So there's really no, no one there that we had seen. Um, so a guy comes out on the tracks, but being very like kind of weird and I mean, basically all Brown, like all, but I mean, all waiters were Brown back then, like wa neoprene waiters that were Brown, all everything's kind of dark colored. There's no bright colors at that time. Right. So that's not really that shocking to see someone in all Brown. Um, but it was just like the mannerism of the person, like the, they kind of like stopped on the tracks. They'd come out of the woods, came up on the tracks and they're looking up with to us, but I mean, it's, we're quite a ways away. So, but you can tell it's a purse standing up person. You can't tell if there's a rod or anything. Pretty hard to say. Like, it, usually you could see in this, like, you could sort of see like the shine of someone's fly rod or, or, or fishing rod, but we didn't see that. Um, but what was really weird is that the, the person or the thing goes down the riprap, goes across the river, right where you can't really cross goes up on the other go like wades across goes up on the other side goes into the woods and at that point both drew and i are like taking notice we're just like okay that is because we had seen the thing and we're like oh there's a guy right and then sure enough you're like well what's that guy doing like why is he just like kind of standing there he's not really doesn't look like a fisherman and we're kind of like in your brain you're sort of like that's just sort of weird right like this is and then he course like goes down the riprap and goes across the river and you're like okay this is just now this is weird right this is strange and so at that point, we're like both reeling in, like we're kind of like, all right, this is kind of, we're going to maybe, we're going to go back up to where my dad is. And so in the meantime, that thing goes across the river, goes into the woods on the other side, within a couple of minutes, maybe a few minutes, not very long, comes back across, comes back across the river, up the riprap, looks at, like, we're all kind of like just sort of freaking out at that point. And then more or less, like, from what I remember, like, almost like seemed like it sort of noticed us and goes like booking down the tracks. Right. And we're like, all right, now we're out of here. Like we're done. Like, that's just, that's enough. Like that's, we're going. So Drew and I basically like at pretty full tilt, like not running cause we're in waiters, but walking all the way back up to the smokehouse and tell my dad what that, what just happened. Right. Cause I mean, we don't know exactly what that, what actually happened. It was just very strange. My dad's like kind of more of a city guy. So he's kind of like, well, I think we should just go. <laughs> this is kind of, he's, he's kind of freaked out right away. So we walk all the way out the tracks back to the car. There's no vehicle there. So we're assume, assuming by the time we drive back to Fergie's, uh, there's probably going to be a guy there getting out of his waders or whatever. There's no vehicle there. Right. So we're just kind of like, huh, that was really strange. Yeah. So just like, that's just a weird encounter. And my dad has written about it, like in a journal entry, and it's pretty much what I just said. So we'd like the, like we've, without discussing it, when he wrote the little journal entry um, and I, I read it and we basically were like, oh, it's actually really similar to what, like, so the, the memory is pretty accurate. Yeah. So that's a pretty, pretty weird one. Oh, I um, love so that, it. Yeah. So love that's, it. that's one that I can't explain. The, the, the footprints are on the, lower Chequemus between the Squamish and the Chequemus, right? Like it's like this lower zone um, and it was in the snow and it was a long set of prints. And I have my, my spay rod down beside the print as well as my uh, wading boot, size 10 wading boot beside the print with photos. And they're like, they have like toes outline and arch outline and it's like a it's a human foot essentially but a huge one so it's really strange that was a really weird one and then the last one that was really really kind of weird was driving up to the thompson um just passing alexandra bridge over uh -huh. the fraser yeah just having like 
being in the middle of the night, because that's what we did back then, right? Yeah. Um, uh, having a trucker in front of me slam on the brakes, like on the bridge, and forcing me to like kind of slam on the brakes and being like, what the hell? Like, why, why, why are you doing that? And then him releasing the brakes and coasting through the, like off the bridge, which I was doing the same then right behind him and having something just kind of out of the corner of my, my eye, like jump the medium, like the, the barrier out down into the bush there, which I never really saw, but it was just a very strange, like your brain kind of just goes like, that's not like a deer or a bear, but you don't really know what it is that you saw. Yeah. So that was my other one. Yeah. But again, can't, can't prove anything, but just pretty strange. <laughs> strange oh, I love ones. it. There, those are yeah, some of my yeah. favorite stories. Yeah, I remember, cool. I remember yeah. seeing that photo and you had me stumped too. Yeah. It's pretty weird. Hey, eh? uh-huh. yeah. I'm curious to hear yours. <laughs> one of these days you'll have to tell me. I will. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, is there anything about your timeline that I've missed that or something I forgot to ask you that you'd like to talk about or mention? Um, no, I mean, I think um, outside of just like the photography stuff, like I've been shooting for, I guess, about 15 years, specializing in like fly fishing uh, photography, as well as like landscape and then moving into like video as well. Um, I have like a, a photography fly fishing book out, um, which is cool. Yeah, it's a very limited print run. I did it uh, last year uh, called Along the River, which was um basically just like um it's like a 12 by 12 hardcover uh 90 page book of photos that were shot kind of during that peak sort of five or almost like almost 10 years of like when i was really going hard with the fly fishing photography so it's like it's um like cast and blast photos like stuff like that like all that timeline so it's kind of neat and it actually features uh four four short stories that my dad wrote through the journal journal entries one of which is the Sasquatch one, right? So that's so that's really cool. So that came out, and I've I've sold quite a few of them, and I'll probably be doing another run of those, and it'll be available at my on my website. I'll link um, all this up, by the way. I'll link your sure, website. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then so there's that. Um, I'm doing like real estate and uh, architectural photography too in Vancouver. Uh, more of like the kind of paying the bills a little bit with that. Still working yeah. at the shop as well. Um, that's a, yeah, I guess that's probably it. Yeah. Can't really think of anything else. Yeah. For, for now, till the till we yeah, remember for now. what else yeah. we've left out. Yeah, kind of like shameless self-promotion. <laughs> no, well, we can always it. sit down again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just so happy we were able to make it work um finally awesome. all these years yeah, later. Me too. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it was a long time coming for sure. You look great. Honestly, you Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I think you look <laughs> healthier than I have seen you look in years to be honest thank you yeah thank you that means a lot i definitely work hard at it and i think things are are pretty good right now so uh knock on wood right like they've been they've been good for quite a while so it's good you deserve it and i really mean it you're one of the most genuine people i've ever met forget fishing thank you very much that means a lot yeah thank you that that is that's a that's very nice yeah i really appreciate that you bet well we'll wrap it up don't hang up 